Welcome back, ladies and gents. Today, we are building an open alternative to Windows 10 using the power of the Linux desktop. Now, this is a follow-up video to a video that I made about a month ago now, and it was about building an open alternative to Mac OS. And uh, yeah, that video did okay. So I thought, you know what, it's uh, the Windows 10 folks are missing out. Time to make a guide for how to start switching your workflow from the Windows 10 operating system that is owned, maintained, and uh, developed by Microsoft Incorporated and move towards a more open source, privacy aware system. And to do that, we have got some suggestions, mostly orientating around Zorin OS. So I'm gonna leave that for now. There's a few things that I wanna break down in this video. Of course, it's gonna be a long one because it's a fairly exhaustive, comprehensive kind of guide. So here's a few, uh, here's a bit of an outline of what you can expect from this video. Uh, part one, I'm gonna unpack the strengths and weaknesses of Windows 10 that we need to be aware of and that we can try to replicate that same functionality uh, in an open alternative. Part two is then gonna be looking at the strengths that Zorin OS brings to the table and how I think those things map fairly closely to what people have come to appreciate about Windows and then try to remove some of the weaknesses that Windows 10 has. Uh, now, the things that I won't really talk about too much that are kind of inherently known about Linux versus Windows is that yes, Windows 10 has a lot of uh, privacy invasive-ish telemetry and user data that gets mined from their system. And so as a general rule, Linux and Linux desktop operating systems are far more respectful of users' privacy and, uh, and also arguably are more secure from viruses, malware, and that kind of thing. Those things have been going around the internet for ages, so I'm not gonna talk about them in this video. Then after I have unpacked the strength of Zorin OS, I will give you some suggestions for how you can tweak your Zorin OS setup to make it uh, function a little bit more like a smooth Windows 10 modern experience. Finally, I'll give you some app recommendations to kind of start beefing out your setup and start uh, helping you explore what is possible in the free and open source software world. Hope you've got it. So let's get underway. Today's episode was made possible by NordVPN. Check out the link in the description to make some huge savings on one of the internet's leading VPN providers. And stay tuned for more details later in the video. Okay, so part one, strengths and weaknesses of Windows 10. Windows 10 is everywhere. Uh, it is the software that Microsoft is uh, is kind of bound by uh, and, uh, and needs to support for a lot of uh, businesses and users around the world. Over a billion people have, or a billion devices, have Windows 10 on them, but it might not be for everyone. And so, first of all, before we go any further, let's try and figure out what are some of the strengths that Zorin OS needs to try and replicate, or that we need to at least come close to to be able to enjoy the same benefits as Windows 10. First of all, backwards compatibility is a big strength of Windows 10. Uh, you can, in theory, run a lot of old Windows software on new Windows operating systems. So backwards compatibility is something that needs to be replicated more or less when it comes to supporting older software, whether it's Windows software or otherwise. Next, we want a relatively flexible bottom panel, uh, like the taskbar, we want a relatively flexible menu system or menu search and launch system because the start menu search that Windows 10 has is actually pretty capable and it would be great to have a relatively customizable uh, tray that can organize our notifications, our system controls and whatever else we need. Also, we want something that can replicate a tablet interface or at least a two-in-one uh, form factor. There are a lot of two-in-ones out there in the world today and, uh, and that's something that Windows 10 caters for that not a lot of Linux desktops do. Now, it goes without saying that there is enormous app ecosystem for Windows 10. That's just a strength that Windows is always gonna have. You can't possibly have a billion users of the same operating system without having an enormous app ecosystem. Another thing to be aware of is that Windows, generally speaking, has fantastic hardware optimization because uh, it is in Microsoft's best interest to load up Windows on as many OEMs or hardware manufacturers as possible and make sure that the Windows experience works really well on the devices that they sell. Now, my recommendations that I can give you just straight away here, if you're interested in buying new hardware and you wanna get something that has Zorin OS or other stuff, on top of it, then definitely go and check out Star Labs, System76, and Tuxedo Computers. All three of these, and there are more, 
uh, ship excellent quality uh, hardware with Linux already pre-installed. Hence, great hardware support. But nevertheless, Windows 10 has fantastic hardware support across a multitude of platforms. We need to have something that can replicate that compatibility somehow. The other strength that Windows 10 has is really good scaling support and uh, managing multiple screen resolutions. So when you plug in an external monitor to your laptop that has a 4K display, being able to drop the scaling down on the external monitor but keep it on your monitor, that's something that Windows does for the most part pretty well. It'd be great to see if we could replicate that in Linux as well. It's getting there, spoiler alert, it's not perfect, but it's getting there. Also, it'd be great to have the Windows subsystem for Linux prints, wait a minute, yep, we're dealing with a Linux kernel. We've got the Linux kernel, we can move on. We need something that can do window tiling across quadrants so that being able to click and drag windows and tile them to the four corners of your desktop is something that Windows 10 does really nicely. We need to make sure we can do that as well as managing virtual desktops so that we can spread our windows across multiple desktops. Another strength that Windows 10 has that we need is solid backups. Being able to have incremental backups that just spit the data that's changed to wherever our backup destination is. In Windows, this is called file history and it's pretty good. So we need to make sure that we can at least get something close to that if we're trying to build an open alternative. Finally, we need to have good mobile integration because uh, yeah, Windows 10 with the Your Phone app is actually pretty decent with integrating with Android phones at the very least. So integrating with Android phones is very doable on Zorin OS and it's just called Zorin Connect. I'm not gonna talk about it in the video because it's very simple to set up and use. Go into your uh, the Google Play Store, download Zorin Connect, open Zorin Connect on Zorin, bing, bang, boom. Finally, we need integration or at least access to and compatibility with Office 365 and OneDrive and the Microsoft ecosystem in general. Because if you're a student or if you are tied to a workplace that uses a lot of these services, you need to be able to log into your email and use your cloud storage and stuff like that. Finally, the big one, gaming support. This one has gotten a lot better over the last two years when it comes to what is available in the Linux world. And uh, while gaming is still a big strength of Windows 10, uh, we can still replicate a lot of the core gaming functionality that Windows 10 gives gamers on Linux, which is pretty sweet. Spoiler alert, a lot of the funky hardware controls when it comes to RGB lighting and stuff is experimental at best. So Google Ubuntu and the name of whatever funky hardware you've got lying around in terms of RGB keyboards, mice, lighting setups, whatever, and see what's out there. Uh, do your research first and see how you go. But in terms of actual software and gaming, installing games, it might not be as bad as you think. So buckle up, let's see what we can do. Now the weaknesses of Windows have uh, been well documented throughout the years. So I'm just gonna belt through them really quickly. First of all, Windows 10 has an extremely fragmented app ecosystem. Uh, whether it's downloading a .exe or a .msi or downloading stuff from the Windows Store, downloading stuff from the Steam Store, st downloading stuff from goodness knows what other stores are out there. Also, there's no native package manager on Windows to seamlessly update the software that's on your computer. For the most part, it's in the works, but it's something that they, they haven't really had up to this point. There is also a lot of legacy cruft that is lying around in the Windows uh, in the Windows operating system that makes it a lot sl more sluggish, not to mention a lot more large in terms of the amount of disk space that it takes up. Brand new install of Windows takes up about 20 gig of your disk space, and that's likely to gobble up more the older it gets. Uh, whereas a basic Linux install can get you in for five to seven gigs. There is a lot of bloat out of the box. And also every six months, Microsoft will push a new feature update that inevitably ends up breaking a lot of things and frustrating a lot of professional desktop users. Also, some of their built-in apps are varying levels of quality. Uh, when was the last time anybody opened up Groove Music, for example? Now, before we go any further, if you are interested in finding the closest representation of Windows 10 in the Linux world, I've got a gift for you and it's called Linux FX 10. I'll leave a link in the description. It's basically a carbon copy of Windows 10, but using Linux. I'm not recommending it here because I don't think it has what we really want. We're not trying to ape Windows 10. We just want to replicate the functionality in the open source world. Okay, let's get onto the desktop and see what we can do.
Before we dive in, a quick word from today's sponsor, NordVPN. So chances are that if you're thinking about switching your workflow from Windows 10 to a Linux-based OS, then privacy is probably one of your digital priorities. Now, with so many people working from home and not having access to their workplaces network security, it might be high time to take one more step to secure your internet privacy at home with NordVPN. NordVPN is one of the most private and fully featured VPN providers on the internet with thousands of super fast servers in 60 countries with unlimited bandwidth and double data encryption and a strict no logs policy for a truly private internet connection. They support all of the major operating systems out there, including Linux, and have super simple browser extensions for all of the major internet browsers. Now, I've been using NordVPN for close to four years now, and NordVPN as like a service provider have not been sitting around either. They've got 24 seven customer support, and they've been rolling out new services uh, like Nord Links, which Linux users can definitely take advantage of as it's built around the WireGuard VPN protocol. Basically, it just gives you extra speed without compromising privacy. It's a completely new way of thinking about VPNs. So go and check out NordVPN following the link in the description or go to nordvpn.com slash infinitely galactic for 70% off a three year plan. So basically for less than the cost of a fancy coffee per month, you won't have to worry about having a secure private internet connection for the next three years. And not only that, but by using the link below, you'll also be helping out yours truly to keep making content. And I consider that a win-win. So go check it out. And thanks to NordVPN for supporting the channel and sponsoring today's episode. Okay, so let's start out by talking about the strengths of Zorin OS as a project and why I've chosen it as kind of the base for this whole uh, building an op open alternative to Windows 10. So there's a few different things that I want to mention here. First of all, um, this isn't by by any means a full-on review of Zorin OS as, a, as an operating system. You can go check out other videos. There's plenty of them out there. I'll link to mine up in the cards. But uh, there's a few key reasons that I see as strengths for Zorin OS for people who are looking to switch away from Windows. So first of all, it's built on arguably the most popular Linux base out there, which is uh, Ubuntu. Um, so that means it runs in the same uh, security and release cycle that Ubuntu has, meaning that the base that Zorin OS uses stays the same. And in theory, you could run it for five years, in some case, more than five years. As it stands, the, the thing that Zorin OS does differently to a lot of the standard uh, Ubuntu releases is that it does actually backport little bits and pieces of uh, the desktop and also it keeps the hardware up to date even though the base of this system came out in 2018. So even though we're looking at almost a two year old operating system at this point, it still has an up to date Linux kernel more or less. And that leads to a lot better improvements when it comes to things like battery life on laptops with Linux kernel uh, 5.4 and a few other things that I don't really have to have time to go into here. Um, but I really think that Zorin OS has a great balance between stability and uh, and having up to date desktop and definitely security is a strong suit there as well, just with Linux in general. Because of the fact it's based on Ubuntu, you also get a lot of community support. So any issues that you might have, solutions that work for Ubuntu usually work for Zorin OS as well. So with Zorin, you do have a very familiar layout with the panel and the taskbar. The, uh, the menu system and uh, just the general look and feel of the desktop. It does have a really good flat sort of uh, minimalistic kind of theme to it. The other thing that I do want to point out is that when it comes to scaling, if you have a high pixel density display or if you have a high resolution display, uh, the interface just through the, through the theming that it already has lends itself fairly well to, um, to very high resolution displays and uh, better scaling support, especially across individual monitors and stuff like that comes with uh, updated release down the track, I would say. So out of the box, it looks okay. And definitely if you're on a high resolution monitor, like a 4K monitor, um, then it shouldn't look too out of place. But if it does, then I would suggest you have a look inside Zorin appearance, change things like the font size, etc., and the height of the panel, the size of the icons, and you should be okay. The actual window controls themselves are fairly decent size out of the box. So they should scale up 
uh, to a higher resolution if you need to do that. Now, the other thing that I really like about Zorin is that for a GNOME based interface, now GNOME is just a desktop environment that a lot of Linux distributions use. Uh, for a GNOME based interface, this desktop environment in my experience on relatively modern hardware is very sprightly. And the other thing that Zorin does very well is that pre-installed software that comes uh, as part of Zorin or very easily installable on Zorin makes uh, gaming a lot easier than it is on other distributions. Now, popular operating systems on the Linux side of things like uh, Pop! OS also include this, but the learning curve here on Zorin is not quite as large as if you were to use one of those other uh, Linux distributions. So for example, if you want to uh, install a lot of your Windows games on Zorin OS, all you need to do is install Lutris. And Lutris will uh, go out and download a lot of the things that you need to be able to run the majority of Windows uh, games and some other software uh, on Linux. The other nice thing that the, that the Zorin OS team do that is unique to their distribution is that they package up more recent versions of the translation software that allows you to run Windows software on Zorin. So that means that you get much better support for installing Windows software compared to uh, a lot of other Linux distributions. So when you download Lutris, you'll be able to download a lot of the other uh, bits and pieces that, you, that your computer needs to run Windows software, at least a fair chunk of Windows software um, on your new Zorin system. Another great choice that Zorin make is that they bundle NVIDIA drivers into their OS by default. So if you notice the first time that you boot Zorin OS, you have the option to boot it with modern NVIDIA drivers. Now, of course, if you have an AMD graphics card or if you're just integrated Intel graphics, no problem. But uh, NVIDIA drivers have always been a little bit problematic on Linux, um, but it's great that Zorin takes the initiative and smooths some of that out for you so you don't have to worry about it. The other nice touch that I do appreciate about Zorin is that the software that they choose to use out of the box integrates very nicely with the online accounts here in system settings. So simply going to the menu, clicking settings and going to online accounts, you can log in with different online accounts here and they will integrate automatically into things like the calendar, into things like the email client, which is evolution and the story goes on. It's just re a really nice touch that uh, a lot of Linux distributions do ship with uh, different calendars and different email programs, but they almost uh, they hardly ever integrate perfectly in the desktop straight from the get-go. I might also mention that with uh, Google accounts and some other accounts, you can also get cloud storage integrated straight here into the file manager under uh, network shares, which is, uh, which is also a really nice touch. So if you already have Google Drive as a cloud setup, a cloud storage setup, then you can very easily log in and have that integrated straight into your desktop. Now, another thing that I've noticed about Zorin more than other distributions of Linux out there is that they have really great uh, documentation and support that the community have provided. So I want to link in the description below an unofficial manual for the um, for Zorin OS. And this unofficial manual has a lot of goodies to be found in it. So if you're the kind of person who wants to read up all about what this thing is capable of before you go and pull the trigger and switch from Windows to something like Zorin OS, then go and check out the link in the description and download the unofficial manual. This thing is huge um, and it has a lot of great details about just what you can do with this system. So these are just some of the reasons that I think Zorin OS makes a great case for somebody who's wanting to move away from Windows 10 and start exploring what open source alternatives are out there. A lot of these things do apply to other distributions, but all in the one package, I think that's why Zorin OS has a lot of strengths. Okay, now let's start talking about tweaking. When you, uh, when you download the Zorin OS core, uh, which is the, the free option on their website, which I'll quickly point out here, uh, when you go to the download Zorin button, if you go to their core edition, you can pay for the ultimate edition, which basically gives you a lot more bundled uh, software and layouts that you can choose from. But you can just download the core as well, which is what I've done and it's what I'm working with here today. The, uh, the $39 option to purchase ultimate is really a way of supporting the developers 
who are putting this system together. Everything that you see in Ultimate, for the most part, you can achieve with the free version, but it's gonna take you a little bit of time and tinkering. So if you wanna um, reach out and support the developers for the quality stuff that they're doing, then I highly recommend you go and grab the $39 Ultimate Edition and uh, install it, you'll have a lot of fun with it. But for what we're going to do today, we're just gonna be sticking with the core edition that you can download for free. So when it comes to tweaking Zorin OS, if you're an existing Windows 10 user, there's a few things that I'd love to share with you. Um, first of all, I've got a few tabs open here of different things that I've been uh, that I've uh, found over my years of using Linux, and I want to share some of those things with you based on what I can see current trends in Windows 10. So first of all, um, one thing that's very close to my heart is uh, is multi-touch gestures on trackpads. Now, a lot of modern hardware, especially on laptops, gives support on Windows 10 for multi-touch gestures. Things like uh, three fingers up to go to the uh, multitasking view. Things like swiping with three or four fingers left or right to switch workspaces, stuff like that. So interestingly enough, there is a project that I've referred to a few times on the channel called Fuzuma. And although the instructions are relatively nerdy, and you might wanna take some time to digest them and see if it's within your capabilities to do this kind of thing, um, it's something that I really recommend people take the time to work out. Now, if you're not too fussed about multi-touch gestures or you have a desktop, then this doesn't apply to you. But I'll leave the link in the description for your own reading and you can go and check that out. For me, it's one of the first things that I do when I set up a desktop because most of the time I am working on a laptop. Uh, and it makes all the difference for things like jumping forward and back in a web browser. It's just a lot smoother. And Fuzuma seems to be one of those that, uh, that seems to work quite reliably for me every single time. I also want to talk about uh, tiling because when it comes to tiling um, the desktop environment that Zorin uses can do uh, window tiling left or left and right but it can't do uh, quadrant tiling and so this is where something like wind tile comes in now I can't mention wind tile without talking about gnome extensions gnome extensions are basically little bits of software that you can add to your desktop to make your desktop do cool things uh, now, the fun thing is, is that a lot of GNOME extensions you can simply install from the software center that's built in to Zorin. If you do want to go down that route, you simply open up the software center, go to add-ons, and you can see here that I've got a huge long list of uh, GNOME extensions. My problem with this is that they don't sort them out of the box. We have codecs, fonts, hardware drivers, input sources, and shell extensions, and these aren't sorted, or at least to my knowledge, in any, uh, in any way. So it makes it quite hard to find what you're looking for. And the search function doesn't seem to work all that well for um, these add-ons either. So what you can do is you open up a web browser, go to extensions.gnome.org, and you can very easily search for the extension that you're looking for. Now this one called WinTile is enabled so that you can use quadrant tiling here on your desktop. And you can see what this GIF is showing us here. And uh, this is very useful if you've got a large monitor or you're used to being able to have the four quadrant tiling like it is on Windows 10. Now, in order to enable this, you need to A, install a browser extension through Firefox. So we just simply click the agree download button, add it to the browser. We say, okay, got it, thank you very much. We reload the page and then all you need to do is say on and that will add the GNOME extension to your desktop through the web browser and then, in theory, we should have quadrant tiling. So now you can see I can tile my windows across the four corners of the desktop. Now in my case, I've only got a 15 inch laptop screen, so I don't think I'd be doing this all that often. But if you are in the mood for splitting your screens in multiple ways, then that's gonna be a great help to you. Now moving on, I do wanna mention briefly the two-in-one support. This was something I probably should have mentioned closer to the strengths of Zorin OS, but funnily enough, there actually is support for a tablet mode here in Zorin. Uh, now, a lot of Linux distributions kind of ignore the, the fact that there are two-in-one devices out there, and yet Zorin took the time, uh, the Zorin OS team took the time to include a touch layout of their desktop, and also made the window controls and other things uh, relatively uh, manageable for a touch screen. So when you switch to the touch layout, 
you'll notice that the desktop kind of rearranges itself to a more touch friendly layout. The idea being that your panel here at the bottom uh, orientates itself to the middle and your menu then becomes a full screen app launcher menu as opposed to a little kickoff menu at the bottom. Now I don't know honestly if there's a way that you can trigger this automatically when you either take the keyboard off your device or flip it around, but it is nice to see that the inclusion is there for those that want it. Switching between layouts is a little bit laggy on my virtual machine, but on real hardware, it doesn't take too long to switch between the two. Now I do wanna also quickly flag that out of the box, Firefox, uh, at least in its current form, doesn't really support uh, touch scrolling on uh, Linux based distributions. Now it's very easy to enable, or when I say easy, there's a little bit of tweaking involved, but it is relatively easy to enable. So again, I'm just gonna leave a, a link in the description down below. I'm not gonna show you how to do that now, but you can definitely go and follow that link if you're curious in how to enable touch screen scrolling in the web browser on Zorin. Okay, now let's talk about how we're gonna tweak this desktop and make it look like a relatively modern Windows 10 desktop. It's pretty straightforward to be honest because most of the things that you want to change are in the Zorin appearance app. There's a fair bit of uh, tweaking that you can do here. First of all, you can change where you want the title buttons. We're gonna leave them at the left hand side for now. The theme, you can come in and change the accent color. So for example, if you're a fan of uh, purple, you can uh, change the accent color and the icon scheme to purple. You can change the dark mode or have it automatically switch between light and dark mode depending on the time of day, which is kind of handy. And finally, when we get to panel, you can change things like the height of the panel, therefore the height of the icons. You can enable or disable dynamic transparency. Something that I like to do is center the task bar so that you have all of your icons and the pinned apps that you have on the taskbar centered in the middle, kind of like taskbar X on the Windows side of things. And you also have a choice between using the left super key, which is uh, traditionally the Windows key on your keyboard to either trigger the menu or you can use it to trigger the activities overview. Now the activities overview is kind of like the timeline view in Windows 10, it gives you a view of your active workspaces. You can add or remove these dynamically and also your active windows. It spreads them out and shows you what you have going on. Now, for me personally, I like to leave the Windows, uh, the Windows key on this activities overview. The reason being is because there's a very powerful search tool up in the top here that you can use with a simple click of the Windows key, start typing and you will get a lot of different uh, options that come up depending on what you're looking for. So you can actually use this for searching for files that are saved on your desktop. You can also use it for searching through settings like I've done here. Eventually things options will populate from the software store and elsewhere uh, to try and be as useful as possible. So this search tool is actually very powerful, but it's very understated in its position here on the desktop. So for me personally, I like to leave the Windows key mapped to this particular layout because it shows me everything that is going on. But if you're more of a traditional user and you're used to seeing the Windows, uh, Windows 10 start menu, and that's a little bit of a hard habit to break, then definitely use that. And you can still have simple search just for the um, apps and programs that are installed here on the desktop. It won't search files or settings or anything deeper than just what is displayed here in the menu. So it's just something to keep in mind. The activities overview is far more powerful and that's why I generally like to leave it there. The other thing is I do like to have the show activities button. there, just in the same position as the timeline view on Windows 10 usually is as well. All right, so once we have uh, enabled all of those things, now we have a relatively modern looking desktop already. You can feel free to come in and change things like the background. Again, I'm gonna use the Windows key to change, uh, to search for where background is and take me straight to it. They have a few great wallpapers built into Zorin by default, including one that changes colors depending on what time of day it is. And that's where I'm gonna leave mine for the day. One thing that I did forget to mention was that I do like to have the, the proper date down here in the panel as well. And that's just about coming down to the clock and calendar section and enabling the date so that the date lives down here in your notification section. So notifications will populate in the little notification manager off to the side. You can hit do not disturb if you don't wanna see those. 
And then obviously you have your very simple uh, settings, lock screen, power on, power off, that kind of thing, and volume along the way. Now on the Windows side of things, you have a, a set of fonts that are common to most versions of Windows. These are the fonts like Times New Roman and Arial and the rest of them. Now, unfortunately, those uh, because of the licensing that those fonts have, they can't come out of the box in a lot of Linux distributions, but they are a relatively simple command away from installing these on your Zorin OS system. So if you go to the terminal, type sudo apt install ttf-mscore-fonts-installer, then that should go out and grab the package that you need to have these fonts like Arial, Times New Roman, etc. The reason being is we have to be able to agree to the end user license agreement. Say enter, do you agree? Yes, you do. And it will go out and install those um, for us. Basically, it just leads to a lot better compatibility with any Microsoft Office documents that you might get sent and you need to open. Now, once those fonts are installed, the only other thing that I would recommend that we do is go and grab the uh, so you go and grab the link for a remote software uh, repository or software store known as FlatHub. Now, for those who are who have been in the Linux world for a while, you already know that FlatHub holds an awful lot of software in it, uh, which is very useful for those who want to take full advantage of the Linux desktop and all the software that it has to offer. Um, so. The good news is that Flatpak support is enabled in Zorin OS out of the box. All you need to do is go to flathub.org, find a Flathub or find a Flatpak uh, program that you like. For example, VLC sounds good to us. Click the install button and you will get a reference file. This reference file is very small. It's basically like a map for to point the software center to where to find this particular piece of software and all the others. Now, the first time you do things, it might be a little bit clunky as this is operating on a slightly older version of the software center. So the integration between FlatHub, this external software source that we're getting things from, and the software center is a little clunky. But as you can see, it's gone ahead and it started installing VLC from FlatHub. And now all we'll need to do is once that's finished installing, it's always good to log out, log back in. And when you go back into the software center in the future, you should have all of the apps available from FlatHub as well as the native software re uh, resources and also the Snap packages. These are basically all just different package formats that are all tied, brought together into the software center so that you can install whatever free and open source software and even some proprietary software from this one software center. So we've covered a fair bit of ground already. Now what I'd like to do is talk about a few app recommendations that might help uh, set yourself up in your new Zorin OS install and also get you going with basic desktop use and also maybe a few little bits and pieces that can help you uh, stay backed up and up to date. So first of all, let's deal with backups really quickly. The recommendation that I'd have for you is to use the built-in backup tool. Now what this will do, once you have enabled it, all you need to do is give it a particular uh, location to store your backups. Now by default, it will just choose to back up your user um, profile. So basically this means your photos, your documents, your music that you store in the file browser in your documents, downloads, etc. folders. Now by default, it tends to ignore the downloads folder and the rubbish bin, but you can add more folders that you want to ignore. You can also add more folders that you want to make sure are saved. By default, you can see my home folder is being saved and downloads and rubbish bin are being ignored. What I love about this particular backup utility is that it's built into the desktop. It's very lightweight. It's very simple to get your head around it. You can schedule what you want to back up when, and you can schedule where you want to store that particular thing. Now, in my particular case, what I tend to do is I schedule a backup that goes to my local uh, network attached storage and also a backup that goes to my external hard drive. I usually run this once a week and the software will very uh, gently prompt me when that backup is due by simply saying that it will back up once the storage is attached. The other nice thing is that you can encrypt those backups so that uh, even if you do back everything up, um, no one will be able to access those backed up files unless they have your decryption password. And all of that is just built in, which is really nice. What I do wanna add is that if you are a bit of a tinkerer and you are likely to 
uh, break your system from time to time, I highly recommend you go and check out a piece of software called Time Shift. A lot of Linux distributions do ship Time Shift um, with their operating system. Uh, time Shift is a great way to back up the system itself, create snapshots of the system and be able to roll back to that previous snapshot. Um, so in order to install this though, there's a few little instructions that you need to follow, which is outside of the scope of this video. But if you are likely to break your system and you want to have a full snapshot always available to roll back to, then I definitely recommend you go and in install Time Shift by following the instructions at the official website in the link below. I wanna give you a quick recommendation for an app launcher that you can use. Now, on the Windows 10 side of things, Power Toys are gaining popularity, especially the keyboard launcher that, uh, that Microsoft have uh, started to make. Now, U-Launcher has been around for quite a long time on the Linux desktop, and it basically does the exact same thing. It is very customizable. It has lots and lots of extensions out there and being able to download a simple installer file and get a powerful keyboard launcher, uh, even more powerful, customizable and extendable than the default Windows key that you have uh, built into the desktop is very cool. So for power users out there, definitely recommend you go and grab U-Launcher and look at all that you can do with it. It's a very small file to download and it takes hardly any resources on your system to do the magic that it does. So keyboard aficionados, pay attention. Next, let's talk about gaming. I mentioned it very briefly already, but the golden standard for how to install games on Linux is always going to be through Lutris and then secondarily through Steam. Now Steam has a fantastic amount of titles that are natively supported on Linux, but it also has plenty of compatibility for, uh, for titles that are built for Windows, but run really well on Linux as well. So just go to the software center, install Steam, install Lutris, and just see what's possible. I wanna throw in a few more app recommendations, things like Zernal++, is a great PDF annotating and editing uh, software. I need to be careful when I say PDF editing. Uh, it's great for PDF annotations and handwriting uh, support. So if you have a touch enabled device with a Wacom stylus, uh, then using something like Zernal++ is a great way to take advantage of that form factor. I'm trying to target apps that uh, replicate a lot of the built-in functionality in Windows 10. If you're into note-taking, then I highly recommend you either look into Joplin, which is also available in the software store, as it is basically an open source, uh, it's an open source version of Evernote, if you're really into uh, note-taking and staying organized on your desktop. And if you want access to simply the OneNote that you already know and love, just by typing OneNote in the top software search gives you access to P3X OneNote. Now all this is, is an electron wrapper of the online OneNote, which is in itself quite capable, but it saves things like the last OneNote that you had open, uh, persistent logins, uh, rudimentary offline support, stuff like that. So you can go and grab those apps if you need access to OneNote on your Linux desktop. If you need access to a to-do app, then I have two recommendations. If you're just looking for something simple, there is a built-in app that, uh, that the GNOME desktop offers you, and it's simply just called To Do. But there are honestly so many out here that you could use, including Electron versions of things like the Microsoft To Do, and my personal favorite, which is called Planner, that integrates very well with the well-known Todoist application. So if you want to stay productive and stay on track with what you need to get done, uh, any of these apps are an excellent recommendation. Let's talk briefly about Microsoft Office support. Now, out of the box, you get a full Office suite installed on Zorin. It's called LibreOffice. It's kind of the standard when it comes to open source, uh, free software, Office productivity. Um, however, in my opinion, while LibreOffice is fantastic for creating documents, I've found that the one-to-one uh, -one compatibility with Microsoft Office documents can be a little bit uh, here or there, depending on the document that you're dealing with. Uh, a Office Suite that I have found that gives really great compatibility with Microsoft Office documents is only Office. Now, in my case, I'm going to recommend that you download the version that comes from FlatHub, as uh, this seems to be the, the, the version of only Office that gives me uh, the best performance with the least amount of hiccups. But as you can see, there are two different versions that are available here. 
uh, there is one from uh, the Snap Store and one from the FlatHub Store as well. Now, photo management is also fairly straightforward. On the Zorin desktop, you get Shotwell, which is great for um, just rudimentary, simple uh, photo library management and simple edits. If you're wanting to go a little bit more advanced, there are lots of great raw editors out there that I could recommend. It's kind of outside the scope of this video though, but look up things like Digicam and Raw Therapy and Darktable. These are all great photography software equivalent in one way or other to Adobe Lightroom. Like I mentioned before, when it also comes to productivity and communication, Evolution being the default email client here on Zorin OS, in my opinion, is pretty suitable for most people. If you want something that looks a little bit flasher and is a little bit more minimalistic, then go and check out Geary from the software store. It's a very simple email client, and if all you have is uh, simple requirements, then Geary is a great way to get that done. As you can see, it just looks a little bit prettier and uh, and is a little bit more lightweight than Evolution. But Evolution integrates fantastically with most forms of email, including uh, including Gmail and Outlook and Office Exchange and 365 and so forth and so on. The last hole in this puzzle is for cloud storage. Now, the funny thing is, is that when it comes to supporting OneDrive, which is the default cloud storage that comes on Windows 10 that Microsoft uh, owns and manages. OneDrive support on Linux is patchy at best. Uh, you can go out and install a, uh, a backend that allows you to access and it will synchronize your OneDrive uh, to your Linux desktop. But uh, for the most part, these tools that are freely available are mostly run in the command line, which is not ideal. Now, there also is a, a, a native uh, tool that you can use to synchronize your OneDrive to your Linux desktop, and it's called InSync. Now, InSync works really well. I have uh, I have had access to InSync releases before, um, but you also do need to be aware that in order to get the full features of everything that InSync offers, you do need to uh, you do need to uh, pay for the licensing. It is a really great tool, and if your productivity hinges on having excellent native built-in file synchronization to a multitude of cloud platforms, then go and check out InSync. Um, however, if you're just looking for a cloud storage provider that runs really well on Linux, and you don't really care whose it is as long as it is privacy aware, then I'd definitely check out pCloud. Um, pCloud seems to have great Linux support. They have privacy and encryption kind of built in and other recommendations would include things like uh, Mega and then obviously the, the prime culprits out there that most people are familiar with like Dropbox and Google Drive are kind of supported out of the box by simply either installing Dropbox from the software store or by uh, simply logging into your Google account in the Zorin desktop. Now, one final recommendation for you is to go and check out reallinuxuser.com. There are a lot of different uh, tutorials and, um, and recommendations that, uh, this, uh, that John has made, and uh, he's categorized a lot of these uh, tutorials and posts to people that want to uh, use Linux and utilize the power of desktop Linux across a bunch of different fields. Now. Uh, I believe he is uh, mostly a photographer as well as other things. So a lot of the posts that he makes comes from a creativity or photography sort of standpoint, but because he runs his own business and other things as well, there are other lenses that he can apply to how to get the most out of the Linux desktop. Now the two, uh, the two systems or the three systems that he uses the most seem to be Linux Mint, Zorin OS and Elementary OS, which I would fully support as great places to start in desktop Linux. So definitely go check out Real Linux User and uh, see if there are some suggestions that, uh, that he can uh, provide you with. Fun fact, there's half my face. So uh, this thing's mutual, probably. Never met the guy, but he seems like a fantastic contributor to desktop Linux. Alrighty, so I think that just about wraps up how you can build an open source alternative to Windows 10 that does most of the things that you would want it to. Again, it's all about identifying alternatives to the things that you do every day. If this video helped you out, then definitely leave a like. Once again, I'll try to provide links below to all the things that I mentioned in this video. And if you're coming from more of a Mac OS angle, then definitely go and check out the, uh, the guide that I had to building an open source alternative to Mac OS. Came out a few weeks back at the time of the recording of this video. 
Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you all in the next one. Hey, Blaine here. Thanks for checking out the Infinitely Galactic project. Look, if you want to find more videos like this, then definitely go check out the channel, subscribe if you're new, turn on notifications, all that good stuff, and you can chat with me on Twitter at Ingalactic. See you in the next one.